In 2010, the Arab region was a completely different place. In many countries, authoritarian regimes had been around for decades, and there seemed little prospect for change. No one could have predicted that a street dispute in Tunisia would end up transforming the whole region. So the opposition to Ben Ali, the calls for an end of corruption, and the demands for more political space kind of all came together to ignite the uprising. They have the same mission. Let's go out and let's bring the regime down. We have a society that accepts violence and that exercises violence and that justifies violence. Prior to the independence, we have never had a political assassination. We haven't had a civil war. It was peaceful by some standards. To us, 300 people killed. That is not peaceful. Tunisia's uprising started with one man in Sidi Bouzid, 190 miles south of the capital, Tunis. Mohamed Bouazizi worked there as a street vendor. He had ambitions to go to university, but the economic reality and the need to provide for his family meant that he left high school before graduation. On December 17, 2010, the police confiscated his produce, saying he didn't have the right work permit. Bouazizi couldn't afford one and crucially, couldn't afford to pay them off either. When his appeal to the local governor's office was rejected outright, Bouazizi was distraught at a system he felt had failed him. He set himself on fire outside. We know what sparked the Tunisian revolution, but what were the reasons behind its ignition in the first place? I mean, I think, you know, Ben Ali's uh, style of rule in Tunisia was really a, a very zero tolerance approach. Um, no political space at all. Uh, I mean, I remember going to Tunisia in 2007, outside the home of every uh, human rights lawyer, there were state security officers in plain clothes. Um, they would follow the lawyers around during the day. I mean, it was truly stifling. So the opposition to Ben Ali, the calls for an end of corruption, and the pressure for, and the demands for more political space kind of all came together to ignite the uprising. If it wasn't in Bazizi, it would have been any other event at the same scale that would have ignited the revolution. But there's one important factor that actually people usually tend to uh, uh, not focus on, was the, the economy. When Bazizi first um, self-immolated, that narrative has helped in the mobilization of people because a lot of people uh, felt that they can relate. The deep unhappiness felt by people in Tunisia didn't arrive overnight. It had been there for years. Demonstrations and hunger strikes were regular forms of protest. But what had changed by 2010 was the emergence of the internet and social media which transformed how those unhappy with the regime received their information and how mass protests could be organized. Saying it is the Facebook revolution, I think it's too much. Facebook was a tool to be, that was out there, and it was used to connect uh, people who don't, don't know each other, yet they have the same mission, which is uh, let's go out and let's bring the regime down. Unlike previous isolated moments of unrest, the small protests quickly escalated to become a movement. They spread from the small towns and suburbs to the rest of the country. Eventually, they reached Susa, the home of President Ben Ali and his wife Leila. Their family were the ultimate symbol of systemic corruption, becoming wealthier at a time when the rest of the population was struggling to make ends meet in a crippled economy. What do you remember most of all from, from being in those protests at the time? I remember the amount of police force that is there. 
and we're talking about the civilian police, so you would not be able to know the person who's protesting next to you, and it was a very tense situation. Everyone took part in these demonstrations, including Tunisians from families linked to the regime. The protests were soon being noticed by Tunisians living overseas. Many flew home to join the revolution, including Bassem Bouguera. A lot of Tunisians decide, have decided to come back. Basically, we've said maybe Tunisia needs our expertise to, uh, to help rebuild itself. Uh, so we had that, that illusion, all of us. And we all came in running, uh, left everything uh, there and just, just came back here. Uh, from my end, uh, I think four of my closest friends followed me here, I think, after a month. Uh, but actually, none of them stayed here. وقت اللي بدات الاحتجاجات انا ما زلت صغيره شويه دونك كان فما صعوبه في اني نتابع شنو صاير بحكم انه انا من عائله امنيه بابا يخدم في الامن وامي تخدم في الجيش الوطني فما كانش سهل برشا انك تكسر الحاجز هذاك والعراقيل هذيك اللي اكبر عرقله معناتها تنجم تكون كنت نتبع بالانترنت مي كمان ساعات نفصع ونخرج من الدار ونمشي نشارك في في الثوره Ce qui a changé c'est ce qu'on est en train de faire aujourd'hui c'est parler sans fermer les téléphones je pense que c'est cette liberté d'expression qui qui a beaucoup changé et qui aussi nous a fait découvrir une Tunisie qu'on Tunisia is now one of the Arab world's leading countries when it comes to women's rights, a feat that wouldn't have been possible without women being on the front lines of the revolution. Les femmes, comme toujours et comme partout dans le monde, sont les moteurs, sont les locomotives, voilà, pour être plus juste. La locomotive, ce qu'elle fait, elle est toujours en avant, c'est elle qui se reçoit le premier coup, mais elle tire aussi tous les autres. Je pense que la femme tunisienne a été, sera encore demain une grande locomotive. In spite of having women and children protesting, the uprising in Tunisia wasn't free from violence. Security forces linked to the regime beat protesters. In some cases, live rounds were used. In the very beginning, the uprisings and the protests were understood as riots through the state-sponsored media. Whatever police action was happening, such as the imprisonment and uh, stalking people back to their households and kidnapping them from their households, these acts of police brutality were portrayed as acts of like keeping the order against the people who are rioting and looting. And it's very similar to all of the narratives of rioting and looting that happen transnationally, not only in our countries, but everywhere else. I was beaten up during the protest. I actually I got, I had a broken arm. And uh, that's what made me decide to uh, so I started an NGO. And the NGO's mission was to reform the security sector in Tunisia. You realize that actually the problem is not in the police. The problem is the women's society. Actually, we have a society that accepts violence and that exercises violence, and that justifies violence. Uh, and the core problem needs, needs, you know, hundreds or thousands of people like myself to actually tackle and, and win the, the battle. Of course, by international standards, it is a peaceful transition. Clearly, it's very different from what has been happening in other neighboring countries. We haven't had a civil war. There hasn't been a long um, crisis, uh, so it was very fast. Again, it was peaceful by some standards. To us, 300 people killed, that is not peaceful. It's easy to forget how massive of an event the collapse of Ben Ali's regime was now, a decade later. Tunisia's uprising had been a long time coming, but it undeniably influenced the rest of the region by setting an example and allowing many living under their own dictatorships to believe that they could do the same.
With Bin Ali now living in exile in Saudi Arabia, an interim government was installed until the country's first democratic elections could be held. His political party, the Rally for Constitutional Democracy, was dissolved, a key demand of the protesters. <laughs> Demonstrations continued throughout the country in the run-up to the vote in October, when the Islamist and Nahda party took power. Ayyub al Jodi is an artist and a leftist secular activist. During the revolution, he worked day and night to see change happen in Tunisia. After all the hard work, the 2011 election results left al Jodi disappointed. نحى نظام استبداد وجاء نظام أشبه للفاشية معناها باش ياخو بلاستو دونك كايني متفاهمين هما نظام بن علي اللي ما عملوش بن علي عملوهم باش خربوا ما تبقى من جمال فيها مكونات شعب التونسي Nahda was obviously the main political opposition party that stood to gain from, from the revolution in Tunis because they, they were already organized, um, they knew their constituencies, and they were keen to figure out a way of, of being in power in a sustainable way. People felt a little bit cheated when they saw how the events turned out. Uh, you do what you're, you're meant to be doing, like to contribute to the process. And then when the result speaks like the opinion of a majority or of a plurality, like this is something that everybody collectively contributed to. أكيد خاب ظني بعد فوز حركة النهضة. يعني نعتبر حركة النهضة حركة ظلمية رجعية. فيس دا زيدا خطر من 2011 ل 2020 عشنا كان حكومات الفساد وحكومات اللي تخدم ضد النساء وضد الفئات المهمشة مع تجويع الشعب وضد الشعب الحكم قسم شعب التونسي بين مسلمين وكفار ودخلونا في عركة أخرى متاع هوية احنا بعاد عليها جمع الحي الشعبي وكانت الناس تصلي وكانت الناس تسكر وكانت الناس تشطح وكانت الناس تكور وكانت فما لحمة ما كانش فما اختلاف بين واحد يصلي وما يصليش Also, they have this like little trick that they're able to establish whenever a political party runs with uh, a religious discourse that is a big component within a political party running for elections. Uh, your gains can be postponed to the afterlife. So if you elect me, you're a good Muslim. الناس يستمعون إلى خطب جمعية فيها التكفير وفيها التهجين وفيها الثلب طيارات سياسية قاعدة تفتن وتشعل في النار بيننا وبين الحكومة وبين الدولة وهي ماشية يحبوا يقضيوا عليها الثورة هذه يحبوا يقضيوا عليها بين يعني كانوا يستعملوا حتى أساليب وهم في الحكم ويستعملوا في الشارع وفي الجوامع وفي البلايس هذيك حسب رأي زادة هم أعداء الثورة والذكاء التونسي زادة At the time, it was still too early for the phrase Arab Spring to become commonplace. But any hope or optimism in Tunisia was already beginning to dwindle. Free from Ben Ali's regime, other forces started to fill up the void. Moderate imams were replaced by more conservative preachers in the mosques around the country, which increasingly led to young protesters swaying towards a more radical narrative. This helped contribute to Tunisia being one of the leading exporters of foreign fighters to Libya and Syria, when those countries were having revolutions of their own. The recruitment of these uh, mainly young people, not only, but a lot of young people, needs to be seriously uh, studied by the government to have an appropriate answer. And the answer needs to be policy. When you have in a country um, over 100,000 kids that drop out of school every year, when you have unemployment rates as high as we do, when you have police brutality that goes absolutely unpunished, when you put young people in jail just for smoking some weed, 
when you imprison uh, people who are uh, gay, when you disrespect and marginalize entire regions and ensure pretty much they never go out of poverty, you do not come surprised and shocked that an ideology that is violent, that, that is attacking the state and its um, institutions is born and is um, blossoming in your country. Since unemployment continued and since the economic situation is deteriorating, not only in Tunisia, but in a lot of places we have seen some Tunisians like leave uh, and join ISIS, this has received like a form of an apologetic discourse uh, sometimes in Tunisia from people in the government that were saying that these are like lost sheep, but the economic component of the decisions that they have made is something that they themselves speak about uh, in interviews where ISIS fighters have like left the organization. They did not necessarily believe in that project, they just were promised bigger salaries and they were recruited in a particular manner. At the end, it was uh, it was like more of a case-by-case -case scenario uh, of people who were like trafficked into that or people who have made these choices and not everybody wanted to return to Tunisia anyway, so the situation is very unclear. The same radical narrative which saw Islamist fighters exported overseas was also creating chaos at home. With the economy still in disarray, terrorism in Tunisia flourished. In 2013, the prominent opposition politician Shukri Belaid was shot dead outside his home. He'd been a persistent critic of the Nahda government, though Nahda denied that it was behind the killing. Other assassinations and attacks followed, including two mass shootings at tourist sites which left dozens of people dead. <laughs> نحكيو في مطالب أخرى الساعة وقت اللي تسمع شكري بالعيد صوته يلعلع في الشوارع وفي صوته مسموع وقت اللي تشوف الناس بدأت تتلم فنانين و... وكل أطياف الشعب التونسي بدأت شيئا فشيئا صار خوف كبير بدأت الاختيالات وقت اللي تم الاستيلاء وصلتوا على الثورة التونسية ومن بعد مدة تتوحد القوى هذه ويرجع الصوت هذاك عالي نلقى وشكون يمثل هالشعب التونسي دونك صارت التهديدات انا واحد من الناس مواطن بسيط جدا ولقيت العديد من التهديدات معناها وهي ديجا العمليات الارهابيه كانت موجهه خاصه لرؤوس الثوره وللناس اللي كانت تحلم بتونس هذه شكري بالعيد قبل ما يتوفى باربع ايام صارت مهاجمته في الكيف اجتماع شعبي في الكيف معناها مواطنين وفيهم نهضويين وفيهم واحد يضربوا بالحجر شكري بالعيد تم تهديده في القنوات التلفزية الفضائية على المباشر وفي في الراديونات من قيادات نهضوي Prior to the independence, we have never had a political assassination. It was a funeral that was national, it wasn't only confined within the realm of like the friends and relatives of uh, Shukri Belaid. موت شكري تزامن مع بداية الإرهاب في تونس معناها تونس من وقتها فما ظلام معناها يغيم على سماواتها. أنا نتصور اللي نقطة مفصلية في المسار الثوري معناها اغتيال شكري بالعيد الاغتيال هذاك خرج مليون ونص في العاصمة فقط معناها كان نحكيو المئات الألاف اللي خرجوا في الولايات الأخرين معناها صارت ردة فعل ما كانوش يتصوروها ورغم هكا من بعد أشهر يصير يزيد يتم اغتيال شهيد الحاج الإبراهيم <تصفيق> Women marched in that funeral as well because they were saying it's a national event. We will not abide by traditions that say that only men need to go to the final place of, of burial of the body. Everybody marched and if we look at the numbers of people who joined that funeral, 
it exceeds the number of people who voted for that party. I feel that that was a moment when legitimacy was withdrawn from them uh, by some of the people within their own constituency because it was a big shock uh, for everyone since we have not had a political assassination since the French mandate. At that point, Jbeli had no other choice but to resign. But in Nahda remained the most powerful party in the presidential and parliamentary elections that followed. It wasn't until 2019 that Tunisians swung away from the party, instead electing the independent candidate Qais Saeed as president. So what's the situation right now with Tunisia, with the current president, with the parliament that's currently active? Where are we at? Qais Saeed uh, won the presidential elections uh, as a huge surprise. He was a slightly populist, um, you know, legal academic, so with a good um, with a good reputation, but not somebody who was uh, involved in, in in politics previously. And he he almost sort of ran on an anti institution and an outsider ticket, and I think was populist in that sense. He uh, really worried us in the human rights community when at some point uh, he said he'd be in favor of a return of the death penalty. He has uh, you know a mixed record on on other rights issues, but. To be honest, the president in Tunisia doesn't actually have an immense amount of power. The current prime minister is the former minister of interior. And so he has a far more um, politically conservative uh, cabinet. We haven't really seen, um, I think, the kind of uh, radical reforms that would uh, fundamentally change um, the way business is, is, is conducted in Tunisia. But we're, we're also cognizant that that takes time. After being a critic for so long, El Jodi eventually became involved in politics. In the 2019 presidential election, he ran the campaign for the leftist candidate Hamma Hammami. <laughs> الناس يبيعوا في الكلام اختلط الحبل بالنابل ما عادش تعرف اليمين من اليسار والثوري من اللي مش ثوري الناس ولات فاقده الامل في كل شيء دونك الناس اللي جاوا زعما من جديد من برا ويبيعوا في كلام ربحوا like الجودي many tunisians felt their mission was not completely accomplished they acknowledge that they've come a long way since the protest movement started in 2011 but at what cost? Mohamed Bouazizi's self-emulation caused an unprecedented wave of protests in Tunisia back in 2011. But for many, now, a decade later, not much has changed. Poverty is still widespread and a lack of opportunity is still being felt by millions. Since 2010, over 2,000 people have attempted to set themselves on fire, while 300 have actually died doing so. There are always 2,000 people who have tried et sans compter ce qui se jette à la mer, c'est triste. Ceux qui ont essayé de s'immoler ou ceux qui sont partis doivent certainement être jeunes. C'est des jeunes en plein désespoir. Et là, franchement, l'État n'a pas fait son travail. Vous imaginez sur les 2000 personnes, 300 qui ne verront jamais ce que c'est qu'avoir 40 ans, ce que c'est qu'avoir un enfant, ce que c'est qu'avoir une famille. Mon Dieu, quelle tristesse. For someone who's worked in human rights, how do you assess this idea that uh, Tunisia is one of the most successful revolutions in the Arab world in terms of its media laws, in terms of its women's rights law? Is it, is it true that it's the best case scenario for the region? If we're comparing Tunisia to the rest of the region, then yes, absolutely. I still, I will stand by uh, the fact that Tunisia is um, the happiest story, relatively speaking, in, a, in quite an unhappy region, I would say. But if you ask me what my human rights concerns are about Tunisia, no, of course, it, the, the, it's, it's, not a, it's not a done deal. It's not a happy ending. It's just that there's still a battle to be fought. لازم بتدخل ثورة أخرى مكملة للثورة اللي فاتت خاطر برشا حاجات مزلنا محققنا همش. بعد السنوات تمشي 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 إلى أن وصلنا العشر سنين بعد الثورة اللي هو رقم مهم معناها 
ولكن ماهوش مهم في في حياة بلاد ولكن أنا ساعات معناها حتى كي نقعد وحدي ونخمم في عشر سنين ما بعد الثورة شنو حققنا نفرح ونتحمس الثورة أخرى ونحزن شوية معناها نحزن نحزن على المشهد السياسي الموجود. The revolutions and the uprisings that have been taking place are today a wake up call for all dictators. I do not believe, although we are going today through a rise of populisms in the US, like in Tunisia, like in many countries in Europe, normalizing with these dictatorships is no longer accepted. And I hope that this revolution that inspired a lot of others to move as well and to mobilize themselves and to throw out dictators, I hope that this would be a pattern every time there is a dictator in place. Je ne suis pas de ces personnes qui diraient « Ah, la belle époque !» Non, non, c'est pas vrai. Euh, c'est pas vrai. Avec tous ces problèmes, euh, avec toutes ces incertitudes, je préfère quand même le jour d'aujourd'hui. Parce que les incertitudes, quand il y a un questionnement, ça bouillonne, il y a quelque chose qui sortira d'ici là. Reste ce quelque chose, il faut qu'on y travaille. On ne peut pas avoir 100 000 gouvernements en 4 ans et dire « on avance ». It, it, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So uh, it takes time. And I think, I think we're doing okay. I feel it's not a grand picture that we need to be painting. We need to understand that uh, it would take time to achieve the changes that we're seeking. And it is completely understandable that after years, over 50 years of repression, uh, we would find uh, that certain things take more time. In over 50 years of dictatorship and oppression that we have had with a one-party system, and like one president, first uh, Burgiba and then uh, Ben Ali for over 50 years, and then within the first 48 hours after the ousting of Ben Ali, we've changed three presidents. And that was because every time somebody is named, people would go back on the streets and say like, no, we didn't sign up for this. One moment that I share with uh, my colleagues and my friends uh, in terms of relating to that revolutionary moment is that for the first time, the poem of Shebi, from this poem, some verses are included within the national anthem. And they speak about the will of the people to uh, incite change. For the first time, it meant something. When the people believe in their power, taking a chance is the only way for them. We took a chance.